But it turns out that there is a significant discrepancy, as we mentioned, between the theoretically calculated and the measured values. So in principle, this g is roughly in the orders of gigapascals, but the theoretical uh, critical stress is roughly, so if we calculate it to be g over 2 pi, but the experimental value is roughly equal to g over 1,000 or 10,000. So there is a significance. So when you calculate something, it should be really, really high. But when you measure, the plastic deformation happens much, much sooner. Okay? So the question is, why does it happen? So when you think about the plastic deformation, so you're basically going from the initial state of the, the material where the atoms are perfectly arranged into something that looks like this, that is pl pl plastically deformed. So instead of pulling the entire part of the crystal, one part of the crystal, and moving it across one plane, what people postulated is that there is presence, or you can introduce defects that are called dislocations. In this particular case, it would be an extra plane of atoms that would make this process easier. What that means is that the, that the stress or the force that is required to go from the initial stage to plastically deform is not the force that is required to move all of the atoms simultaneously, but rather it, in, you introduce one particular defect here that then travels throughout the material, and the stress that is required for that is significantly lower. Eventually, you will end up in a deformed material. And again, an example of uh, such type of a defect is... Uh, can see in this model. So again, this would be this extra plane of atoms. So when you look this material beneath and above the defect itself, it looks roughly perfect, right? The atoms around the dislocation core are slightly deformed from their original position, but there is this extra plane that runs through this upper part of the crystal, but that does not really go or doesn't penetrate through the lower part of the material. So this would be called an edge dislocation. Okay, so again, people postulated that this would happen and that this would reduce the stress that is required to permanently deform the material. And if you go from the initial to the final plastically deformed part of the crystal, again, you introduce this additional plane. So this is simply, these are the planes of the crystals. There is additional plane that exists here. And when this dislocation propagates throughout the material by applied shear stress, you will eventually end up in this configuration that is, again, plastically deformed. You end up, so the initial and the final states would be identical, right? So, and you can somehow intuitively think about this if you have a carpet, right? It's much easier to move the carpet if you do it gradually. Instead of just having something that has a large friction with the floor itself and pulling it, you can do this gradually. So you can, again, there is a certain intuition that you can apply here that would explain why, why these steps are easier to be performed and why do you need less stress to be applied to plastically deformed material. So, um, so with this, what we introduced is basically the concept of a defect. Even if people, uh, so in 1930s, so this concept was introduced. Uh, electron microscopes did not exist. So, they, so it was not possible to observe these defects. But again, there are many, many properties of the materials that now you can predict and explain if you, have, if you use this concept of dislocations, right? And I already mentioned that this particular type of a defect, um, where you int simply introduce one plane, extra plane in the crystal, is called an edge dislocation. And we will learn that there are different types of dislocations where we will have to describe them in a certain way. So there are a couple of things that will, will um, characterize a certain defect. So one, for example, is what is the magnitude of the deformation around the crystal? So this will be called a Burgers vector. What that simply means is that if you have a defect, how much of the strain is around this defect? And that will, for example, depend on how many extra planes you introduce or what are the planes that are being introduced, right? So if I have two extra planes, the strain around the, the dislocation will be different. Why, would it, why do we care about the strain? Why do we even want to understand what is the strain around the dislocation? Think about some of the properties that we mentioned, right? So we, we talked about the properties that are governed by dislocations. Why would they depend on the magnitude of the deformation? Mm 
uh, we talked about, let's say, conductivity in semiconductors, right? How electrons will be scattered around the defect. <coughs> so if this defect, for example, introduces a, a larger strain, so if the deformation is more significant, the scattering of the electrons will be more affected, right? So again, the magnitude of the de defect itself, or of the dislocation, will tell you how these dislocations will interact among each other. Uh, it will also determine how quickly the dislocation will move throughout the material. Uh, it will tell you whether it's easier or less uh, straightforward to anneal out that defect from the material, how it will affect the electrical conductivity in others. So the magnitude of the deformation is really significant. So because there are different types of dislocations, we will have to introduce different types of dislocation des uh, descriptors, which will simply tell us how we describe a given dislocation, right? So there are two dislocation descriptors. One will be called Berger's vector. and we will label it as a vector B. It will simply tell us what is the magnitude or which is the, what is the plane that is being deformed within the material. The second is the dislocation line, or a tangent vector. And we will label it as T. So just to demonstrate what that means is that we already mentioned that an edge dislocation would be an extra plane that is introduced into material. But for example, if you have two of these planes introduced, then the magnitude or the Burgers vector will simply tell you, again, what is the level of the deformation. So if you have one or two extra planes, the Burgers vector will tell you that. So it will describe the magnitude of the deformation. It will also tell you what is the energy that is associated with this defect, etc. The dislocation line will be something like this. Again, if I have an edge dislocation, and if, it's, uh, if I insert this extra plane inside of the crystal, so in principle, these are the three-dimensional planes, right? So this is an extra plane. These are all planes. So the dislocation line will be the line that will tell me in which direction the dislocation propagates throughout the material. So this does not necessarily have to be a straight line, as you saw in the TM Im in transmission electron microscopy images. So this will be the line that will tell you how this extra plane, how does it propagate, or how the dislocation propagates throughout the material. And because there are these two descriptors, there is the Burgers vector and the dislocation line, we will see that there are two very specific classes of the dislocations. <coughs> ones are called edge dislocations, so these are the ones that I showed you. The other types of dislocations are called screw dislocations, and they are slightly more difficult to visualize, but the model is here, and you're welcome to, to look at it. But we will define exactly how, how these dislocations are formed and how do they look like. But in principle, um, they are described by different descriptors, but they are also formed by different mechanism in the material. So to describe how they are formed, we will have to define a slipped and unslipped part of the crystal. What that means is that if you form a defect here, so this would be a slipped part of the material. So I apply a shear stress. The left part, left from this defect, is a slipped part of the crystal. So it is the part of the crystal that slipped from its original position of the inside of the perfect crystal. And the right from this would be unslipped. So the dislocation line or the tangent vector simply separates slipped and unslipped part. of the crystal. So an edge dislocation, so we mentioned there are edge and screw dislocations. So for an edge dislocation, the shear stress that I'm applying, so the shear stress, and is perpendicular to the dislocation line or to the tangent vector. Again, what that means is that I'm applying a shear stress to the material in this way and the dislocation line will run par perpendicular to that line, right? So in this particular case of an edge dislocation, the tangent line would be within the crystal. So it would be like this. So this would be the tangent vector. For screw dislocations, so the shear stress is parallel to T. 
Well, that means in this particular case, with, which illustrates the screw dislocation, the shear stress, again, is applied to the material itself. But the material is deformed in a way that the dislocation line runs parallel to that shear stress. So this is the difference in the way how the edge and screw dislocations are formed and what is their relationship to the applied shear stress. We will also see that there is a very clear difference between how the Burgers vector relates to the, to the tangent vector in these two uh, dislocations. So in principle, they have very distinct descriptors that describe them. But this is basically the way how they're formed. Okay, so with this, uh, I will stop for today. But next time, we will talk extensively about how the dislocations can be introduced in materials, how they can be reduced, how do they influence the mechanical properties, um, and how do you influence the dislocations in the material such that you either enhance the strength or change the mechanical properties. Okay, uh, have a happy Thanksgiving holiday, and we will see you in roughly 10 days, I think. Okay, have a nice break.